Well, good morning. We're ready to start chapter 16 of Secondhand Summer and uh, find out how things are going to go with Sam now that he's kind of back by himself. He managed to find his missing friend, Billy, but Billy is having to leave and go to California after the death of his father. So Sam's feeling a little lonesome. That Sunday after Billy left, Mom, Mary, and I took a trip to the Matanuska Valley for fresh vegetables like we used to grow ourselves. I think Mom did it to break me out of my funk about Billy leaving and summer ending. School was just a few weeks off and I was nervous about facing the first day alone. For the first time in months, I could see more trees and rivers and mountains than houses and buildings, and I wanted to stay there. We drove past tractors baling hay, and there were kids riding horseback across the freshly mown fields. Most places had acre after acre of potatoes. Would you like to hoe that field of potatoes, Sam? Mom asked. No, thanks. I rubbed my hands on my pants legs, remembering my sore palms from last year's hoeing. Do you miss it, she asked. Yeah, a little. You were getting to be quite the farmer last year, you know, when you used to help me in the garden. Seems like a long time ago, Mom. The farmers were tending long rows of potatoes, carrots, and cabbage, and we bought some lettuce and radishes from the stands that stood on the corners of the field where a farm road met the highway. Mom cooed over every bit of produce, critiquing the varieties. Then she got weepy and walked back to the car. She was smiling again when we found a place that offered you pick raspberries. Okay, kids, let's pick some and make jam. Wouldn't that just taste the best? Mary rolled her eyes. Oh, mother. Mary, you love strawberry jam. Sam, you want it too, don't you? My mind said, not really. But I said, sure. The farmer gave us little metal pails and pointed out where to pick. He chewed on a toothpick and talked raspberries with mom. Yeah, it was a good year for, for berries. Plenty of rain and enough sun to keep the things warm. You should find some good fat berries there. Picking was slow at first, but in a few minutes, Mary and I had forgotten our resistance and picked along together, chatting with mom in the August sun as if everything was just fine. How come you don't hang around with those dorky friends of yours anymore? Mary asked, flipping a raspberry at my face. How do you know I don't? Because they call when you're not home. She stopped picking and put a womanly hand on her hip. You could always call my friend Janice, you know, she giggled. I slipped a handful of berries in my mouth and said, high school girls don't hang out with dumb guys on stupid bicycles, you know. So how about your buddies? I don't know, like you said, they're dorks. I hurried on down the row in search of better picking. The field was feel feeling mighty small. Then Mary surprised me. You've been hanging around down at that club, haven't you? Is that where Billy found you found Billy? Maybe, I answered quietly. Maybe. Come on, Sam, tell me. I've heard there's going to be a party there this Friday. I froze. Even though I knew it would happen eventually, hearing it made me worse. What? I didn't want to act too surprised, but I was. Yeah, I guess somebody found out about your little secret, and now it's a place to be. So? So what do you think mom will say about that? What's the word? Uh, breaking and entering? A month before, before Billy disappeared, I would have taken the bait and I would have gone into it with Mary. Not anymore. I don't think you're really going to tell mom, I said. If she hears anything weird, she'll hear it, have both of us grounded and there'll be no party for you either. Mary's mouth was still open when I walked off down the row and set a full pail of, pail of berries on the table and walked out to lean on the car. Across the road were a couple of girls about my age cutting zucchini and packing them in boxes. They worked along a row, stooping to cut the green squash and then lay them carefully in cardboard boxes. At the end of the row, they stood and stretched and shaded their eyes with dirty hands to look around. They peered at me, eyeing them and waved. They had brown arms and ponytails bouncing above their tight, sweaty t-shirts and cut-off jeans. I was feeling pretty alive right then and feeling bold, so I sauntered across the road. Hi there, looks like hot work. One of them smiled at me. You bet, you want to help? 
Yeah, said the other. Don't just stand there gawking. I hung there for a moment, admiring their invitation, measuring the honesty of two pretty girls in the sun picking vegetables. But there was no chance to run and join them, though my mind and body wanted to say, yes, yes, yes. Sammy, Mom says it's time to go. Mary called with a laugh. Say goodbye to your little friends. I waved half-heartedly to the farm girls and trudged back to the car, glaring at Mary while I did and wishing Billy had been there to help me flirt with those girls. Mom was caught in the moment. Look, she said, pointing to the aspens lining the field. Those leaves will be like gold coins when they turn. Another six weeks and they'll all be dead. I didn't like her saying that word, dead, death, dying. After I'd worked for four months not to say it in front of her, like it was a new four-letter word, she said it herself and didn't even flinch. We'll have to come back in the fall and see these leaves. Your father always liked the fall. All the way home, I tried to figure out what might be going through her mind. How did she feel about dad now that he was gone? Did she ever wake up and forget he was dead? Did she still cry after we'd gone to bed and she was alone? On one hand, I wanted her to talk about Dad, to remember things, but on the other, I could never bring him up around her. That afternoon was the first time I'd heard her volunteer any comments about Dad in months. Finally, Mom cleared her throat and said, You know, kids, your Dad's been gone most of a year now. I think maybe we're about out of the woods. I leaned into her words, wanting more, waiting for the stories to hang on to but only silence followed, and we all wrapped ourselves in memories as we returned to the city. Chapter 17. The next day, I wasted no time getting to the club. I rode my bike through the weeds right to the back door. I wanted so badly for Mary to be wrong, but I knew she wasn't. If someone was planning a party, that meant they must have broken my lock to get in. And sure enough, my padlock hung open on the hasp and the door wasn't even latched. I almost left right there and then, but unfamiliar courage pushed me into that building. It smelled mustier than I remembered and I couldn't see a thing. Someone had been there all right, but the place was empty now, empty of people, but not their garbage. When I flipped on the lights, I found the floor littered with smashed light bulbs. Tiny shards of glass were everywhere and I knew that Taylor and Masick had been back playing light bulb grenades. They must have broken every bulb in the place except the spotlights for the bandstand. When I found beer bottles and crushed cigarette butts as well, I knew that Mary had been right. Taylor and Masick had sold me out and given up the club to some older kids. She hadn't made any of it up and I knew right then that I'd lost it all. I spent an hour sweeping up broken glass and trash before I gave up and headed home. Just for spite, I hung the lock back on the way I had it and hammered the nail flush with the rock with a rock so that getting in wouldn't be easy. They would know Sam Barger had been back. Taylor and Masick would know I was in on their betrayal. I wanted a little joy in my life, so I stopped at the Big G and sat at the counter staring at nothing. Be right there, Shirley called from the far end of the counter. Then she turned back to giggle and slap a boy playfully on the shoulder. It wasn't Alan, but some new guy in a jean jacket. He was thick and blocky, but not tall with straw colored hair that he slicked back. Eventually, Shirley made her way over to me with a glass of water. Hey, you look like you lost your best friend. Well, I guess I did, I said. But before I could say more, she was fetching me a root beer. This will cheer you up, she said. You'll see. Then she was back down at the end of the counter, leaning over to chat with that guy again. I barely tasted the root beer, and I was glad I didn't order a Sunday because I wanted to be gone from there. I wanted to be gone from everywhere. I spent the rest of the week waiting for Friday. I couldn't forgive the hurt of losing the club to a bunch of older kids, but I couldn't resist it either. I had to see how it looked full of people and music. And when Friday night finally rolled around, I waited until 8 o'clock, and then I told Mom I was running to the store for a minute, and I took off. By the time I got there, I could see teenagers already slipping through the brush in the club's back door. 
They had parked their cars at the ball field and worn a path around and through the alders. I counted at least three couples in a small group of guys who had gone in when the music began to leak through the broken windows. I could hear voices, but I couldn't recognize them, and for some reason that mattered, so I kept closer. A few feet from the door, I recognized the song and imagined the dance floor full of teenagers swaying in the dim light spilling off the bandstand. The music played louder now through the open door. You've lost that love and feeling by the Righteous Brothers. The music stopped, and suddenly I stood pressed against the back of the building, just steps away from the door. I heard everything, my breath, the thundering pulse, the traffic on C Street. Then for a moment, there were no cars gunning up the hill, and I could hear voices again from inside. See, I told you it was cool. It was Masick, dirty, stinking, rotten Masick. His cocky little voice was bouncing off the wall like a missed shot, and I caught it hard. I was moving without thinking, in through the open door, down the hall, and into the main room. A circle of shadows hovered in the center of the dance floor. My dance floor. They were standing close together, so I couldn't make out Masick or Taylor among them. The shapes were larger than I was used to. High schoolers. I could see four or five of them, and then suddenly I could see Masick, small and shadowed in their center. Masick, you bastard! I used the word for the first time, and I tasted its power. And then immediately the mass of bodies opened like a mouth and spit forth Masick. Sam, hey man, good to see you. Wham! I hit him full force in the gut and followed him to the floor, pounding his body, his arms, and his head with my bald fists. You dirty bastard! The power of the word was hot and strong and good. And then some hands had me and dragged me up and away from Masick, pinning my arms so I couldn't swing. And that's when I saw Taylor back in the shadows, hiding a bit, and he was laughing. I thrashed against the strong arms holding me and kicked out at Taylor and got a slap in the face for it from some guy I didn't know. Get out, I screamed. You don't belong here. Go find your own place. That got me slapped again, and this time by a guy I did know. It was the guy from the diner, the one I saw flirting with Shirley, he was here with the rest of the kids, and he looked more like a man than a teenager. Ah, we like this place, shithead, so you get out, said the blonde guy in the denim jacket. I could see the strength in him and knew I wasn't going anywhere until he said I could. This is our party, and I don't remember sending you an invitation, he said. Behind the curtain, the music started again, and I saw three couples up on the bandstand moving out to dance in the light. This ain't your place anymore, kiddo. I looked around at the kids Masick and Taylor had sold our secret to. They were all pretty big, bigger and older than me. I was alone and outnumbered, and I knew this battle was lost before it really began. Even if Taylor and Masick had magically drove the others away, the secret was out. As It was lost as a thrown water balloon. It would tumble through space and shatter into a mass of water and rubber shreds that could only shrivel and disappear. What's going on? Another voice I knew. It was coming from the darkness by the doorway. You guys throw a party and not invite me? The voice moved toward us but stopped outside the circle of light. It was Alan, Mr. Perfect. I was able to spin around in the sweaty arm that held me so I could see him. Alan squinted into the lights. We under attack or something? The husky wrestler who held my arms laughed. Kinda. The guy from the diner laughed also. This kid busted in uninvited and punched our little buddy here. Foul mouth little creep. I can't believe you hang out with these jerks, I said to Alan, trying to sound tough. That got me slapped a third time. I didn't say you could talk, you little puke, growled Mr. Denim Jacket. There was more threat in his voice this time, and he leaned in so close I could smell the cigarette smoke in his clothes. Wait a minute. Is that you, Sam? Alan asked, friendly as can be. He turned hard eyes on my captors. Tell your buddy to let him go, Stark. Sam's a friend of mine. But this little moron's asking for it. So are you. I could feel the tension in the room rise as the hold on my arms relaxed and I pulled loose. Then I knew I was right about Stark. He was the guy in the denim jacket from Big G. He was the guy I'd seen with Shirley. 
And until that moment, I never thought much of it, but obviously Alan had. Alan stepped back from the group. He hooked his thumbs in his front pockets and did a James Dean pose. What are you guys doing here? Alan asked, like this was his private home and we were intruders. It's mine. Ask those little rats over there, I said, pointing to Masick and Taylor. What's yours? This place? As Stark? Everybody laughed except Alan and Masick. He had retreated to stand next to Taylor and nurse his pride. A lot of people seem mixed up about what's theirs tonight. Stark looked, stared over at Alan, a strange look on his face. It felt like they were continuing a conversation they had started earlier. Then, in the background by the bandstand curtains, I saw Shirley step into the light. She stood with her arms folded across her blouse, her hair perfect and wavy. Alan saw her too, and he looked back and forth between her and Stark. Suddenly, Stark and Alan seemed to be in the center of the room with the rest of us in the shadows around them. Stark's group moved toward Alan, and the room felt small and hot. I realized that Alan and I might be on the same side, or at least in the same boat mad and outnumbered. I found this place first, I said. Me, me and Billy Anderson. Billy's name fell like a cast spell, lengthening the shadows and bringing the mass of bodies back together in the center of the light. You mean that kid that got wasted? Stark asked. Wasted. They still thought he was missing or dead. Guess the word hadn't gotten out that he'd been found and now was gone again. Billy was so totally gone, in fact, that it seemed stupid that he had so much power over these kids. Yeah, I said. Does that scare you? Oh, yeah, kid. I'm wetting my pants. I'm so scared, laughed Stark. He slapped the blonde kid next to him on the back, a smiling face ravaged by pimples. Oh, my, said Pimple Face. Do I hear a ghost? Oh, you're not funny, I yelled. My frustration, Billy. You're just a bunch of jerks. Just get out of here. Pimple Face kicked at me with a pointed black boot that I knocked away. Come on, I challenged, foolish and desperate. I'm not afraid of you, zit face. Alan grabbed me then and dragged me away. Easy, big fella. He walked me off away from the crowd, all the time looking back at Shirley. How'd you find this place, he asked, trying to calm me. Trying to calm me down, I guess. I always thought it was just an old building with nothing inside. When I didn't answer, he kept going. Anyway, you need to get out of here. You don't want to mess with these guys. I was too busy trying not to cry to answer. And that's what I wanted to do. To cry with no one around to gawk at me. I was supposed to be too old for that. But it was cry or hit somebody. Alan patted me on the back and looked around at the soda fountain, the counter, and the lines of stools. I could tell he was getting carried away in his imagination. This could be a cool club. We could have dances and bands and food. You want me to get out and leave it for you and your buddies, don't you? What? He stopped listening to me and turned back to look at Shirley and Stark, standing close in the shadows. Just like always, high schoolers only. We'd be left out, I said. I walked away. They're not my buddies, I heard him say. Mr. Perfect didn't understand. Nice as he was, Alan was just like everybody else who seemed to lose their memory as soon as they turned 16 and forgot all about what it was like to be young and out of place, a kid that nobody wanted around. I was heading for the door when three more guys walked in. Wow, holy crap, the first one said. There's a ton of cars out there. I think everybody on this side of town's crashing your party, Stark. I pushed past them into the doorway and was met by a rush of bodies. A cluster of jeans and t-shirts came through, pushing me back inside. That's when I saw the fight. I couldn't hear the words between them, but I didn't need to. I watched Alan, tall and graceful, dance in towards Stark. He squared his stance and punched Stark in the side of the head. Stark was caught off guard and staggered back, and then came at Alan like a heavyweight boxer. He crouched low, ready to pound Alan with his both fists. And for a moment, Alan was Muhammad Ali, bobbing and weaving to avoid Stark's long arm jabs. Then the ring of kids closed in around Stark's buddies, cheering him on while I stood frozen at the edge of the dance floor. The circle around the fighters was tight, and someone pushed Alan in the back, making him stumble forward. Stark grappled with Alan until he was able to wrestle him to the floor and punch him hard on the back of the head. Alan rolled free, but when he stood up, the big guy was waiting and pounded his fist into Alan's torso, his chest, his head, 
And then Alan went down again. Stark was stomping around Alan and yelling so I could hear him now. I ought to kick your guts in, he said. Alan was still and looking like he was maybe passed out. I could see blood leaking out of his nose and mouth. One eye was closed and starting to swell. Give it to him, someone shouted, and Stark moved in to kick him with his heavy work boots. Alan caught his foot and pulled Stark down as he landed hard on his back. Alan rolled away and stood up. Suddenly it was Alan on his feet and Stark trying to get up. Behind the fight, Shirley was standing at the curtain, biting her lip. The music was back on and the Rolling Stones sang words to the song, Satisfaction. Then Shirley screamed. Stark was getting to his feet and I could see something shiny in his hand. It was a knife, a switchblade. He pressed a button on the handle and the blade flashed out. The force of its presence seemed to fill the room. Someone gasped. I think it was Shirley. I hoped it was. Alan, I screamed. I wanted him to run, to back away from the blade, but he was past that and he went toward Stark instead, challenging him. Come on, come on, you coward, he yelled. And then I was running. Not away where I wanted to run, but toward them, toward the fight. Pimple face stepped in my path, tried to block me, but I ran right through him, knocking him to the floor. Stark and Alan lunged at each other without touching. I leaped past them and up onto the bandstand, and out of the corner of my eye, I could see Stark lunge again. Alan stumbled backward and slipped, almost falling. I reached behind the curtains and hit the light switch. The room fell pitch black. I could hear Alan and Stark shuffling and grunting below me, and then the place was suddenly silent, except for the heavy breathing of the two fighters. Then, cops, cops, out front, someone near the door yelled, and there was a mad scramble for the back door. I jumped off the bandstand and toward the fighters. I found Alan and grabbed his arm. This way, I whispered, don't follow them. My arms were adjusting to the bits of light coming through the boarded up windows, so it was easy to find my way to the broken window we had escaped through earlier in the summer. I kicked out the plywood and climbed out. I reached in and grabbed Alan's arm, Alan under the armpit to help him through. He flinched. Don't touch me, he groaned. Hurts too much. He climbed out on his own, but too slowly. I was worried the cops would walk back around. Alan's Chevy was parked in front of the club, so I didn't have to look for it. There was a cop car parked next to it, but it was empty. I could hear the cop yelling around the back. Alan staggered to the passenger side and tossed me the keys. You got to drive, he moaned. I can't do it. He had his hand pressed over his ribs, and when he lifted it up, I could see the blood soaking his t-shirt in an ever-widening circle. And there was a darker gash across his ribs. Stark had gotten him with the knife. Before I could protest, Alan was inside the car. I slid into the driver's seat. Under the car's dome light, I could get a better look at how messed up Alan was. His, uh, he had a swole, eye swollen shut, and the other had a big cut above it with blood running down one cheek. I could see blood oozing between his hands where they were pressed to his ribs. It was already dripping down his arm and onto the car seat. He moaned and leaned back. I thought he was fainting, and then he mumbled something and his head flopped down onto his chest. What do you, what'd you say, Alan? He raised his eyes to mine and spoke more clearly. Don't tell me you can't drive a stick shift. Well, uh, I started to protest, then I shook my head. I can do it. I was shaking so much I dropped the car keys and it took forever to find them and get the right one in the ignition. I looked at the patrol car and knew the cop could come help us and call an ambulance, but that would mean more trouble. So I jammed the car in gear and hit the gas. I silently gave thanks to Dad and Joe that let me drive the Jeep up and down the beach last summer. The clutch and the gas pedals didn't feel the same as the Jeep, but they were in the right place. We did stall a couple times before we got out of the parking lot, though. On reflex, I drove down Hollywood Drive a couple of blocks and then pulled into an alley and parked. I was panting like I'd run a mile, and I really wanted to drive and drive until we were far away from the Caribou Club. But Alan was bleeding, and I had to know where and how bad. With a bit of gasping and groaning from Alan, I got a look at the wounds. The knife had slashed across his ribs and gashed his arm. The rib wound was deep, but I couldn't tell how deep. The arm was bleeding the most. Alan kept mumbling and pushing my hands away, but I managed to wrap his arms in a towel I found in the back seat. 
I slipped out of my jacket and pulled my t-shirt off, which I wadded up and pressed against the rib slash. Alan gritted his teeth, but other than that, he was silent, staring out into the night. Hold this, I told him, placing his left hand on the makeshift bandage. You're going to be okay. The cuts aren't bad. I wasn't sure I believed what I was telling him, but I needed to tell him something. As scared as I was for Alan, I couldn't help notice the blood staining the white leather seats of his pride and joy. It's my hand that hurts the most, he said, after I'd bandaged his cuts. You know, you might have broke it when you hit Stark in the head. Pretty stupid, huh, over a girl? He had it coming. What a jerk. Alan chuckled weakly. He had it coming, but I'm the one who got it. He went slack again. I thought maybe he fainted. I turned back to the wheel and fumbled to find first gear. Don't worry, I'll get you to the hospital. I found the gear and pulled out of the alley. No, Alan snapped. Oh man, you need a doctor, you're a mess. No doctor, he said. Just take me home, Sam. Dad'll know what to do. Take me home, it's just down the street. He was sounding really weak again. Really close, really close. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what the right choice was, but I did know that if I had a dad, that's what I'd want. I'd want to be with him. Okay, Alan, let's get you home, I said, easing out onto the street. Alan laid his head back again. Thanks, Sam, you're a lifesaver. I could never hit, I should never hit Stark in the head. I should never hit him at all. I didn't say a word because I had just realized that I was driving a 56 Chevy two-door hardtop down Hollywood Drive with a beat-up varsity letterman bleeding all over the front seat. Well, let's keep going. Chapter 18. I got to Alan's house and had a few tense moments at the front door when I had to explain to his dad why I was bringing his son home all cut up. In the end, his dad looked me in the eye and said calmly, you did the right thing. Mr. Hansen asked if I was okay and then helped his son out of the car. I took that opportunity to head home, but he called me back. Young man, he said in a calm and steady voice, I hope we can count on you to keep this between us. Nobody else's business. Yes, sir, I agreed. You can count on me. Alan reached out his good hand and I took it. He said, you didn't lose that club, Sam. You just found it for everybody else. It'll work out. You'll see. We shook hands and that was that. The TV news was on when I got home and I heard a reporter talking about a police responding to a teen party on Government Hill. I acted indifferent when mom said, Thank goodness you're home safe and sound. I hope your sister's behaving herself. Oh, I'm sure she is, Mom, I answered. I'm sure she is. I was asleep almost as soon as my head hit the pillow. And when I woke up in the middle of the night, I could hear it raining. I went to the bathroom to pee, but when I got there, something grabbed my gut and thrust it into my throat. I could see Stark leering with that switchblade in his hand and Shirley biting her lip. I could see Alan's blood on the car seat and smell it on my hands. I vomited, kneeling and hugging the toilet as tears dripped down into my mouth. I crept back to bed, curled up under my quilt, and listened to the rain. Morning. Morning was a long way off, and it was good for the rain and me and the quilt. When the day came, the brightness gave me hope. Mom was sleeping on the couch under an afghan when I sneaked out to buy a morning paper. The Sunday Daily News was a big wad under my arm as I trotted up the sidewalk and the stairs to our door. I had been tempted to open it right at the stand, but I waited. And in my room I could read it, as if the ritual of the reading and seeing the whole story would ease my guilt, my fear, my anger. I spread the front page out on my quilt. There was the Caribou Club. The story told of a teen gang fight broken up by the quick response of the police department. I read every word, every following, even following the story that made more questions than answers. No charges filed, no injuries reported. There was a profile on the building itself, one official, official calling it a public nuisance. I concluded that the cops knew about the fight, but not who was involved. There was a chance that Alan and I would never be identified, and that was fine with me. That day, I went for a bike ride along the bluff where I had first met Billy. 
I couldn't sit around home waiting for the police to come again and take me downtown again and ask me questions again, so I roamed the bluff trails and tried to forget. Around me, little kids were riding bikes over the trails in the sunshine. They laughed and challenged each other to try new and bigger bumps. Through the alders, I could hear other kids playing on the swings and the teeter-totter. One high-pitched voice was chanting, teeter-totter, bread and water, wash your face in dirty water. I zigzagged through the brush until I could see Melissa. She rose suddenly from behind the green foliage and then dropped out of sight, and a tiny black head rose opposite her, and then she rose again, lifting her hands towards the clouds and making me smile. I passed beyond the playground through a barren lot I'd visited the first days at the apartment. Its sides were too steep for bikes, and so there were no trails through it, just fireweed and alders. Leaving my bike, I made my own trail into the green, out of the brown and the gray. Except for pop cans and beer bottles, I could have been sitting on the bluff above our beach sites on Cook Inlet. The brush rustled before me and a pair of brown wings thrashed the air. I leaped aside and laughed out loud at a grouse when he ended his flight on a branch of a cottonwood sapling only yards away. I could hit you with a rock from here, I warned. The grouse chuckled and bobbed its head. Beneath that tree, I made a nest for my thoughts and I dreamed up a tale of building railroads through Alaska. I made great roads with beds of gravel and paved in steel, and I cut spruce and birch trees, laying their trunks across bogs so I could cross the muskeg. And when the first engines coughed their way into view, dragging a string of squealing, clanking cars, I crossed the mountains again and lived with the Indians. The dreams were getting stronger again, and I found I could go for an hour without thinking of anything real. But I couldn't get away for long. Mostly I couldn't get away from Alan and Shirley, Alan and Stark, and Shirley and Stark, and I was starting to see how complicated life could be. I had made Alan into Mr. Perfect and admired the way he had it all together. He was the cool older guy that kids like me envied. And now he was probably feeling as much of a loser as I was. Who would ever imagine that Mr. Perfect would get dumped by his girl and lose a fight and have to be rescued by a 14-year-old secondhand friend? I waited several days to hear from the police or from Alan, but I heard nothing and was haunted by the silence. I could only think that Alan and his dad decided not to press charges and nobody gave names to the police. I was restless and lost, living in limbo. Finally, I gathered the courage to ride my bike to the Caribou Club. I intended to just cruise by, but when I saw work trucks in the parking lot, I turned in and bounced through the potholes. Instead of sneaking around back, I walked straight up to the front door and found it standing open. There were paint buckets and drop cloths and a radio playing country music. On the side of the building, I found a man on a ladder. Fresh paint covered nearly half the building already and making it seem taller. Hey kid, looking for a job? No, just looking. The man on the ladder was small and round with a face like Santa Claus. Looks pretty good, don't it, he said. He had stopped painting and was leaning back to admire his work. I agreed with him and dared to ask another question. Why are you painting it? Because they're paying me to. He laughed at his own joke and I smiled. The city bought the place, I guess. I idly tested the paint and my finger came away with a spot of cream. To my right was our broken window, the escape hatch we used when the cop locked us in. I remembered the dry, tight choke I felt that day. What are they going to do with it? Turning it into a teen center. Can you believe it? One more place for you kids to come and spend your parents' money and get in trouble. He pointed to a sign leaning up against the building. The looping modern style letters read, The Hangout. The man climbed down from his ladder. Big gang rumble here the other night, I hear. Big fight. Oh yeah? Yeah, a cop came by here the other day. Said it was just two boys fighting over a girl. And then a couple of buddies jumped in and the kid was outnumbered. One of those east side, west side things, I think, like in the movies. One pulled a knife and the other one lost. He took off his hat and scratched the remains of his hair. Lucky somebody didn't get killed. He shook his head. Doesn't make sense, fighting over a girl like that. You better fix that window, I said. Huh? 
I pointed at the window Taylor had kicked out back in July. Somebody might break in. I laughed at my joke and left him muttering something about smart aleck kids while he stirred more of the cream-colored paint. I walked my bike across the gravel one more time and turned up the wrong street when I reached the top. I had to ride past two blocks of strange houses to get back to Hollywood Drive and the Big G. I had a quarter in my pocket, enough for a root beer. I ordered from a red-headed lady with a wedding ring and too much makeup. She smelled like old perfume and called me sweetie. As I pushed out the door open on my way out, my hand pressed a small poster announcing, Teen Center Grand Opening, into summer dance, all high school students welcome. Chapter 19. The night of the big dance was the last Friday before school started and I felt lost. All that day I moped around our apartment, flopping on the couch, flipping through magazines. About once a week, Mom took over the dinner cleanup job and did a top-to-bottom wipe down on the kitchen. She was halfway across the cupboards with a rag when I blurted out, Mom, can we take a ride? I want to show you something. What's that, she said, like she was expecting a picture I had drawn or a cut on my knee. We have to go somewhere, in the car, please. Mom was already in a robe and she hated to go out after dinner. Her day was done. But for once, this just this once, she got her coat and purse and went with me. It was as if I had used some powerful magic on her. Not put, No put off, no questions, she just went. I know now that she must have been paying more attention than I thought. She must have sensed my need. What is it you want to show me, she asked as we motored through a drizzle down Hollywood Drive. Just wait, Mom, just wait. She was shooting skeptical glances my way, and I was glad the drive would only take five minutes because her patience wouldn't last 10. And as we approached the intersection by the Texaco station, I saw long lines of cars spraying water through the headlights as they turned left in front of us. We parked on the hill above the club, the hill where I crashed on a bike a million days ago, and below us a stream of cars drained from the river of traffic and flowed into the gravel and puddles of the old Caribou Club parking lot. Mom pulled out a pack of cigarettes and lit one. What in the world are all these cars doing here? I thought this place was closed. More to the point, what are we doing here? It was closed, Mom. The club, I mean. That's what I wanted to show you. Why? What does this have to do with me? Or you? Not you. Me. It has to do with me. I found it. The club. And I opened it. That's what. Me and Billy and the other kids. I leaned into the dashboard, groping for support. Mom looked at me. It was a shocked look like I just admitted to murder. What on earth are you talking about? We opened it, Mom. Now listen, and just listen and don't kill me or anything. We found a way to get in. The cigarette fell from her lips and she fumbled for it. You, you broke in? Well, kinda, but we didn't break anything, just a window. And that was only because we had to get out when a cop locked us in. Her eyes widened. Now that's not what I wanted. Oh, that's not what I wanted to tell you. I was racing a train across the crossing. I had to talk fast before she got upset or quit listening, or both. Well, see, we wanted a hangout, you know, like a fort, our own place. Anyway, it's this really neat ballroom with lights and a bandstand, and it's got a restroom and we restaurant, and we cleaned it up, and the lights work and everything. And then you lost it? And that's what this is about? You lost something that wasn't yours in the first place? I started crying. It was ours, Mom. Nobody was using it, and they just took it. I pulled the newspaper clipping out of my pocket and wiped my nose on my sleeve as I passed it over. I just wanted everything to be perfect, for her to know, for someone to know that I did it first, that I started the whole thing. Don't wipe your nose on your sleeve. Mom handed me a tissue from her purse. It smelled like her and gum and leather. She read the newspaper out loud, leaning toward the dome light, letting the cigarette smoke curl up through the glow. An abandoned nightclub gained new life this summer when a group of young people looking for a place to dance opened a side door and set about cleaning the old caribou club. A police investigation reported a break-in but found that the youths had cleaned the rubbish and broken furniture from the lounge and the ballroom. Rather than breaking windows and vandalizing, these energetic young people had the building in tip-top shape. Unfortunately, on August 20th, violence erupted between rival gangs of thugs and several young people were reportedly hurt. 
Hoping to prevent further unsupervised gatherings by providing teens a safe meeting place, the city has leased the property and opened a teen club for the city's youth. You did this? Her mother's voice was confused. Do the police know you did this? Yes, we did it. No, they don't know about us. Who got hurt? It was Alan, the kid who fixed my bike. He's okay now. It was a fight over a girl. It wasn't gangs at all. Thank goodness. With her blessing, I was off and running again. See, we found it first, me and Billy. We cleaned it up, and believe me, it was a mess. We hung out there a few times, but then the high school kids with their hotshot cars found out, and they took it away from us. And that's where Alan got into it with Stark over Shirley. Just teenage stuff. He was fighting over a girl, and pow. I don't know about any of this. Mom pulled her coat up around her shoulders and looked squarely in my face. So since when does a son of mine break into a building, empty or not? We weren't trying to steal anything. We were just hanging out. Wasn't it locked? Mm, well, sort of. There was this little door with a crummy lock, and it was just sort of jiggled open. I had her undivided attention. I told her how the club was dark and spooky and dirty when we first found it. I explained how the lights were left on and how neat the bandstand looked with the colored lights on, on it. I told her almost everything. I told her about the fort and the Quonset hut and that Billy wasn't hiding in the railroad yard, but in the club itself. I told her I wasn't friends with Masick and Taylor anymore, but I didn't tell her the rest. I couldn't handle the story about Stark and Alan or about me driving them home. That would have been too much. You sure you didn't break in? I wasn't off the hook until she was sure, until she could find a way to justify all of this to herself. Yes, Mom, don't you see? I wasn't breaking in because it was mine. It was mine and they took it. They took it just like they took the tree fort back home, just like they took Dad. And now everything is secondhand. My bike, this apartment, don't you get it? We had everything, just perfect at the club. It was brand new and now I'm stuck with nothing but a hand-me-down life that nobody else wants. Mom's arms reached around me. Oh, honey, your dad is dead. Nobody took him. And your tree fort, it's still there where you left it. We'll go back. It's still our house. And we have to make, but we have to make a new home here. I didn't want to come here either, away from our friends and our home. But I had to. It's the only way. We had the fish sites. You let them go. All of the wrongs I had felt all summer came pouring out and I just cried. It was like all the sad I'd been saving since Dad died suddenly flowed out of me. I sat and cried with Mom's hand on my back and her talking softly like when I was little, and for the first time in a long time, being little felt good. When I felt too weak to keep crying and the stinging stopped in my eyes, Mom and I sat and watched the parking lot fill up below us. The couples walked like Siamese twins straight through the open doors. Clutches of girls zigzagged through the cars with their heads together, giggling and pointing with their hairdos. Packs of boys in groups of three and four came in at angles and sculpted along the edges of the lighted entrance. Cars raced their engines and then quieted when they passed the police car parked in from the shadows. We could see it all from our spot on the hill when I first, where I first crashed Billy's bike and first saw the Caribou Club. We listened to music that I couldn't dance to. Finally, Mom started the car and patted my leg. You'll be going to dance sooner than you think, son, she said. I knew then that she did understand, at least a little. School started the following week, and I could feel the hint of frost in the air as I walked to the bus stop for the first time. Mary had pegged my pants for me so they fit tight all the way down the leg. We had reached a simple truce. I traded a day of house cleaning for her sewing. I used my basement cleaning money to buy a pair of pointed shoes like the Beatles wore. No more Sears and Roebuck jeans and canvas sneakers for me. My sleeves I rolled up to the elbow. At the bus stop, I stood with a blonde kid in a leather jacket and we waited coolly, leaning on a light post, as if mourning the end of summer. We watched the grade school kids with new shoes and lunch boxes as they formed a noisy line, each wanting to be first on the bus. A cluster of pimple-faced high school boys stood smoking by a parking car, watching the girls in their new hairdos and short skirts. A black kid I've seen around the apartment stopped to share our lamppost. You were Billy's friend, he said. Cool guy. Too bad he split. Yeah, it's too bad. He was a good friend. 
Going back to school's a real drag, blonde kid said, scuffing the sidewalk with new kids. I smiled. Yeah, but then summer was kind of a bummer, too. Then the bus arrived, and we followed the younger kids on without comment. My first class was English, and I sat next to a girl in a miniskirt with a smile that reminded me of hamburgers. I smiled at her and hoped she didn't have a boyfriend with a car. Hi, I'm Sandy, she said when she saw me looking at her. She had light brown hair down to her shoulders that bounced when she talked. Before I could answer, the bell rang and a woman's voice at the front of the room cleared itself for nine months of talking. Welcome to Freshman English. I'm Mrs. Herzog. We're going to start right off with writing an essay. I've written a few first line on the board for you. Now let's see what you can do with it. Written on the board in perfect cursive were the words, this summer was exciting because... I smiled. Sandy smiled at me. Then I chuckled and blushed a little. Was I, I was, was I going to cry right here in front of this girl named Sandy in a miniskirt and 30 other kids that I didn't know? Keep it quiet, young man. Mrs. Herzog was short and lean and a dark dress. She stood on her toes to peer down the row at me. Save your jokes for the lunchroom, young man. Remember, you want to start the school year on the right foot. Sandy smiled again. I wanted to tell Mrs. Herzog that neither of my feet felt right. I wanted to tell her that watching a girl undress was exciting or that a car wreck was exciting but scary. I wanted to tell her that it was exciting when your dad is dead but you don't believe it and when your friend isn't dead but you believed he was. I wanted to tell her that exciting meant scary as hell like Stark or railroad cops. I didn't tell her any of that. She didn't deserve to know. Instead of writing, I sat and stared at Sandy while she wrote long, smooth sentences with large round letters, filling the pages of her notebook with the endless strands of blue lace. I studied the curve of her thigh reaching out from her skirt and down past the knee to where the lightly tanned skin disappeared into knee socks. I looked at the way her lips were pursed and serious, the bottom one disappearing inside her mouth as she chewed it, writing without looking up. I felt warm and unsafe as I wondered if Sandy knew how to dance. And then I wrote at the top of my paper, this summer was exciting because I was famous and nobody knew it. The end. And the adventures of Sam Barger continue in my book, uh, Back Home, where we go on another adventure with Sam Barger when he's uh, an older kid in high school and uh, his brother Joe goes off to fight in the war in Vietnam. Come and join us. Maybe you'll find that on audiobook soon or you can find it at Amazon or maybe even in your public library. Thanks.